Good morning, everyone. This is Ron. Uh, it's Saturday morning, a little after 10 a.m. and uh, 21st of January. So we'll get started and see if we have any questions uh, about your week or anything you uh, anything that may be on your mind. Any questions? I think on last uh, Monday we we kind of all. Uh, talked about what was discussed on, on Sunday, the things uh, Pastor talked about Sunday. And uh, we, let me see if I wrote some of the things down. I know, uh, talking about some of the things that, that Nick had discussed. So uh, the concept of heaven and hell and, and uh, what else? Some of the, uh, but anyway, if anybody want to do a recap or if anybody have any questions about any of this, please, please uh, ask your question. Good morning. Um, this is Nick. Uh, I can continue uh, with uh, uh, some more on this same topic uh, after anybody has any questions. Okay. Good morning, this is Janice. I have a question. Um, Nick, you mentioned a little while ago a show on Netflix, I think called Ancient Apocalypse, is that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay, so I started watching the show and I noticed that in these different cultures, there are, um, I guess what the host called heroes that appear after um, like a great flood or some kind of apocalypse and they come, this hero comes and basically delivers civilization to the people, shows them how to farm, um, like astrology and um, like math and all kinds of stuff that basically pushes that culture forward. Um, and it's typically a bearded figure wearing robes and I'm just kind of wondering like how that fits in with our understanding of the flood and Noah and I don't know I'm just really kind of curious about that um the show talks about uh mm -hmm. basically like an advanced civilization that existed during the ice age, or at least the potential for an advanced civilization. And they, and the, the journalist is looking at the different sort of evidence available for that. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my question. It's a little rambling and I don't want to take it too far off the topic, but I'm like really curious about it. Sure. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, it is still on Netflix, I think, but it is about, yeah, um, evidence of an ancient sort of collective human disaster or a series of disasters that seems to be common um, among a lot of cultures and is uh, again represented in the Bible by the flood uh, of Noah. So what's it called again? Sorry, I missed the name. Ancient Apocalypse. And it's pretty good. I like the guy who does it. Um, of course, not much of that is accepted by uh, Sort of most mainstream modern uh, science, with a few exceptions, but esoterically, and I do believe that there is evidence for, and there will be more evidence for, uh, esoterically, the uh, uh, sort of city or nation or state of Atlantis is uh, more or less a given. Um, that was a sort of real era of human history. And it was a distinctly spiritual type of civilization in its technology and in its sort of the reason for its uh, self-destruction ultimately. And I think there's quite a few things that indicate that there are entire eras of human history that we are sort of more or less not aware of, uh, at least 
in terms of a sort of mainstream acceptance. And that's partly for lack of what they would consider enough evidence. Um, and partly because of a sort of dogmatic adherence to a particular worldview. Um, can you, <laughs> what was your, uh, the, another part of your question, Janice, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I was just trying to kind of piece together what that sort of mythical hero figure that shows up like in cultures around the world uh, and yeah. delivers enlightenment basically like I was like maybe that was Abraham but I don't think so um mm -hmm. or maybe it was a like like the the hero is often depicted as a giant um and that could be like a, a giant spiritually or a giant intellectually um or maybe even a giant physically I don't know but I just found it interesting that cultures were moved forward basically from this this sort of advanced civilization that was sending out a person or people to help move humanity forward around the world. Mm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, so cyclically, as I've spoken about before, um, there are periods of uh, sort of great evolution in human society and the way we relate to each other and in terms of our spiritual development and periods of de-evolution of that spiritual development, uh, how we relate to each other, our technological capacity, etc. And part of what is mentioned in that series, Ancient Apocalypse, and actually all the legends um, uh, that it refers to are that Somehow, after these periods of destruction or periods of downturn, there appear to various peoples of the world, uh, uh, sort of people who remember the high science and remember the high spirituality from before a sort of disastrous occurrence, and they attempt to rebuild. And like in the show, uh, it says many people made depictions of these bearded figures um but i think it's more than that there's uh sort of a lot of depictions of different kinds of people who were relatively advanced that showed up in various other places of the world um another one of those i think would be olmec heads and if you know the olmec heads there's those giant heads who look very distinctly african that appear in various places in Central uh, America. Um, I think that's also part of that phenomenon. I think there was much more movement of people and knowledge around the planet uh, than is generally accepted. Uh, and the reason there's not as much evidence for that is because of uh, those kinds of disasters that is being spoken about in ancient apocalypse. And uh, other reasons, too. I think they were smart enough not to impose themselves onto the people that they encountered, um, except when necessary. Not the prime directive. Exactly. <laughs> That's a Star Trek concept for those who don't watch Star Trek that says you can't interfere with civilizations as they're developing. Um, and you have to be careful about how much technology you give them. But anyway, carry on, Nick. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it is very interesting. Again, um, the Atlantis is basically a, is a given concept in uh, the esoteric understanding of human development on this planet in that it was a real thing. It was an actual place. Um, and I do believe we will have more concrete evidence for that. Um, but um, in the Bible, the story of Noah is definitely related to this whole concept. Um, it is more, I would say, explicitly yeah. spiritual. But all of these sort of cycles of uh, evolution, these cycles of de-evolution are all, um, that's the word I'm looking for, are all uh, the result of the shift in our energetic state, the shift in our collective spiritual state in response to our environment 
in response to each other. Uh, we have the ability to mitigate any potential sort of disastrous events, and I guarantee you we are in a period where <laughs> the potential for disaster is as high as it has ever been um, and have been for a while and will continue to be until we resolve our own internal confusion and bring balance to ourselves and our external environment. So as for who specifically these sort of ancient peoples were who were able to uh, move around the world, bringing relatively advanced technology, et cetera, to uh, other groups of people, uh, I don't know. And I really want to learn more. I think there's some books I'm gonna read that will help out with that. but. Uh, it's very interesting in the various ways in which they are depicted. Um, like having beards, that's uh, typically a uh, like a Middle Eastern European thing. Uh, obviously, the Olmec heads are very distinctly African. They are not bearded. Uh, so I think there's a variety of very interesting things that happened to various groups of people. Um, though I will say uh, Europeans tend to have emerged much later than uh, most of these uh, sort of much more ancient civilizations, uh, although that's not to say that there can't have been some people who had uh, features that we might associate with them, like the typical uh, sort of straight beards like are presented in some of those stone uh, depictions. but. Um, I don't know. And ultimately, it uh, kind of doesn't matter. Uh, but I do think it's interesting to see how human history goes back much further. And in a much more interesting way, uh, and not that sort of uh, mainstream history is not interesting, but there's much more to our story and the true development of humanity on this planet. And that's this Netflix show is a sort of interesting uh, indication of some of that history that has been forgotten. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That... Oh, go Sorry. ahead, please. I, I was just going to say it's interesting that you would say that because um, the Olmecs were definitely African, <laughs> um, but yet there's nothing in the history books that talks about them being. African and that Africans got to the new world. Um, um, we went through the anthropology, the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City and all the artifacts they have say definitely the Olmecs were African, but we don't hear that. We don't hear that at all. Yeah, I think there's a, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted this, Barbara. I just wanted to um, remind us of, of one thing: um, the the word apocalypse is is translated as catastrophic kinds of uh, um, things that occur that definitely get our attention. But the original uh, it's from the Greek, and originally it means revelation. So. Um, it is up to us to see what is revealed in those events that appear catastrophic and to um, um, and, and in revealing them um, to help set that chaos in order. So apocalypse, uh, like the apocalypse of John is revelation of, of some uh, uncovering about the divine. And so uh, that's why it's always important not to be uh, become um, depressed or, or distracted um, spiritually during, during great upheavals, upheavals because what we are looking for is what's underneath, what's, what's driving, what, what, what's the revelation uh, that is revealed that will guide mankind toward uh, understanding uh, and experiencing itself as divine. Thanks. Thank you.
thank you. And everybody, I'm going to step away for a minute or two, but I'll be right back. <clears throat> Okay. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. question. I'm sorry, I yield. I yield. No, I yield. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, since we're talking about apoco apocalypse and everything, um, isn't today the new moon? Um, January 21 is the new moon, and we're to stay upbeat and positive in order for us to continue to make a change in the universe? That's my question. Yes, ma'am. I, I hear you. I, I did. Okay. We are, matter of fact, the more the, you are, the more um, positive your thoughts are, the uh, higher your vibrations are, which means that um, when, I talk, when we talk about high, high vibrations, we're talking about being vibrating or being, uh, being one with the universe or being one with the creator. So the higher your, your thoughts are or the more positive your thoughts are, the higher your vibrations are. And it is very important. Uh, that we uh, stay in tune with uh, what's happening around us as well as in tune with ourselves so we can um, be aware of where we are at that any given any given moment. Um, I believe that, as Barbara said, um, that these are this apocalyptic um, teachings about revealing something uh, that is actually right in front of us, but we are unable to see it until it is time. And um, I do believe also that we are definitely in the process of seeing a huge amount of, um, of, of change, even with the chaos that's going on above uh, we are not aware, seemingly, of what's going on beneath the surface of all of the chaos. Beneath the surface of all of this chaos, the puzzle of life is being put together, meaning that the change, the balance that we uh, talk about so so much and, and want uh, so deeply, is, uh, is in the process of revealing itself. The um, things that we see chaotic, as chaos now, they are distractions. And the distractions are not, they are not there for us to be distracted. Uh, if it were possible, they would fool the very elect. If it were possible, the very elect, those who are searching for balance, would be fooled by the chaos into believing uh, that it's going to be quite a while before change comes. However, uh, those, the, the very elective ones who are searching for this are able to see that beneath the surface um, there are people who are continuously working uh, to um, bring balance, and they don't, they don't call it balance. Uh, they talk about it. In terms of being um, a, a being one people without regard uh, to race, gender, etc., and that is definitely taking place beneath the surface all over the world, especially in America, is taking place. So when we see the the McCarthy's and all this happening in government, that's pay that no attention. That's not where the real work is being done. The real work is being done, and uh, one one of the things that's been shown to us about the real work that's being done uh, is um, is it, what happened in Georgia. The manifestation of um, the uh, election in Georgia was more than an election; it was it, it was a um, a signpost to tell us that while uh, we're looking at the, the political 
uh, surf, the things on the surface that this organizing and these changes are saying to us uh, changes in the air. It is here. It must be manifested. So, anyway, feel like I'm rambling, but just keep your eyes uh, on what's happening beneath the surface as opposed to being distracted with what's happening on top, uh, above the surface, because above the surface distractions are for those who are divided, not for those who are searching for balance and working in that direction. And, and Nick, are you back? Yep, I'm back. Okay, um, for for the benefit of some who um don't uh, have a clue about what we what you're saying, there may be people on this line who don't know what Atlantis is. And if you would briefly um uh, explain that, be most appreciative, sir. Sure. Um. So just in case, well, uh, we may have. Uh, heard the legend of Atlantis at some point during our lives, but that esoterically uh, speaking uh, was a real uh, location. And it was a sort of period of high technological and spiritual development uh, amongst the group of people at that time uh, until it wasn't. <laughs> um, it's very similar to now. There's a uh, what we would consider our quote unquote our civilization to be uh, very advanced and we exist at the same time as many other groups of people around the world who are not so quote advanced in terms of their sort of physical or material technology anyway and so these kinds of groups of people these kinds of civilizations can exist at the same time and uh, Atlantis, and the actual name for it um, is similar to that. I don't. I don't think it's exactly Atlantis, uh, but the uh, group of people who were living in Atlantis were very much uh, technologically and spiritually advanced. They are the source of a lot of the sort of pyramids that we see in various places in the world, in Central and South America, as well as Africa, uh, particularly in Egypt. That was sort of both of these places have traces of more ancient knowledge that was passed on to them. Um, and the idea with Atlantis is that it was uh, a story told to Plato, the Greek, the ancient Greek, by, uh, I believe it was one of his teachers, or Plato learned of the story from uh, something even older than him, uh, that one of his teachers, his Greek teachers, learned while in Egypt. Um, but it was basically a story told by Egyptian priests to a Greek, and it eventually made its way to Plato. Um, and they were pretty specific about when it existed. And that's uh, fairly interesting because in that show, Ancient Apocalypse, uh, it sort of is looking for a type of disaster that would have or may have contributed to ending the civilization of Atlantis. And the time period that the ancient Egyptian priests said Atlantis existed lines up, or it seems to line up, with um, the time period for things like ancient comet impacts, um, et cetera. But there is overlap between what evidence exists scientifically for some sort of ancient disaster and the uh, actual time period that the ancient Egyptian priests, priests told uh, the Greeks. So I think there's going to be more information that comes out about that more concrete uh, evidence. But esoterically, in terms of the uh, oral tradition and sort of spiritual history, that is very much a given. And it was 
within this cycle of history, probably the most technologically advanced uh, place on the earth at the time. And when we say technologically advanced, it was uh, not necessarily that they had things like computers in the way that we are technologically advanced now, uh, but they did have very advanced uh, science and they did have very advanced uh, spiritual uh, applications of that science. And they had things like, as I mentioned, the pyramids, which were used for particular purposes. Uh, they had things like crystals, which were used to uh, basically generate and direct energy. Um, all kinds of uh, very fanciful things that we I'm sure have at some point heard about, uh, but they were able to use them. And ultimately, uh, that's part of what destroyed them as well. So in the legend, of course, they rose to the height of their civilization, and then the downturn began, and they became more ego-based. They became more selfish, and that eventually resulted in their uh, self-destruction. And that is the same cycle that any civilization goes through. Uh, it's something that we are recognizing now that we are kind of going through on a planetary level. And it is something that we have to not recreate that sort of cycle of egotistical uh, self-destruction. And I don't believe we're going to, although it is going to be a bumpy ride for the most part <laughs> while we're in this period of transition. Um, but Atlantis was very much a real place and what they were able to do there uh, technologically and spiritually are things that I think are going to become more of a part of our mainstream understanding of uh, sort of science and reality the further we move into the age of Aquarius essentially and the further we begin to remember how to unlock these kinds of uh, uh, technologies, which are themselves just sort of extensions of uh, spiritual awareness. Um, but basically what happened at the end, uh, and it wasn't just one sort of uh, instance of self-destruction, it was a period of decline, and there were sort of multiple instances of uh, cataclysm. And eventually there was one that was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. But at the end of that period of decline, there was a sort of dispersal uh, of the knowledge that was present in Atlantis to other parts of the world. And as I mentioned before, that's where you get some of the uh, similarities between places like uh, some places in Central and South America and some places in Egypt. Um, and other places in Africa. And it's because the people who lived in those areas are inheritors of some of the knowledge that was um, sort of kept in Atlantis and places like it. Um, and that's some of the reason for the similarity to a lot of the concepts that we see in various places in the world. Uh, so I believe I've heard that uh, sort of specifically the towards the end of Atlantis, some of that knowledge went to Egypt, it went to Peru and places around that, that in South America, and it went to Tibet, um, probably other places, but I think those were uh, sort of major centers where information like that was passed down, uh, probably somewhere in Turkey as well. Uh, but that's just, um, I forget, various books that I've read have mentioned places like that. Um, but the point is, uh, if we don't recognize the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat them, of course. Um, and we are in such a period now where we must deal with the nature of the selfish ego that produces self-destruction in every cycle so that we do not have to recreate that in this one. And that's the, my 
basic breakdown of Atlantis. There's still a lot more that I want to learn uh, and see how it connects to the sort of true spiritual history and esoteric history of human development. And when I say esoteric history, it's uh, I mean to refer to the history that comes down through oral, oral tradition, through uh, what we might consider legend or myth. But all of these things are the ways in which humans have attempted to pass along and remember events and remember other eras of humanity. And the specific details, the uh, might not even matter in some cases, but in the case of Atlantis, there are specific details that have made it down uh, to us over time. And I think those are uh, part of the reason that uh, so many people are interested in actually searching for it, like uh, is presented in that Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse. And that is the basic overview of Atlantis. Um, and there's definite similarities to sort of what we are doing in this era of history and what they were doing uh, towards the end of their uh, civilization. Interestingly enough, one of the legends associated with one of the reasons Atlantis met its downfall is that they turned their sort of knowledge towards egotistical pursuits, one of them being the creation of uh, artificial beings. Um, so uh, the easy way to think of that would uh, just our, our modern equivalent would be robots um, in the sense that they wanted to create essentially uh, servants that would do everything that they wanted. Um, and that directly parallels our uh, sort of emerging desire to create uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robots, et cetera, and the sort of spiritual place that these types of creations come from. Uh, on some level, they are just tools, but the general trend, of course, is that they are products of our uh, desire to attach ourselves even more strongly to material reality. Um, they're generally and mostly the product of spiritual ignorance and especially the way we want to use them. Um, anyway, yeah, that, that sounds like Elon Musk. Sounds oh, yeah. like what he's doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he um, may be from Atlantis. <laughs> I'm sure various reincarnated uh, people who were present during certain periods of Atlantean history are with us right now trying to do similar things. Um, but anyway, so that's the basic overview of what Atlantis is and sort of what it represents and how we are in a similar position now. Thank you, sir. Okay, I have one last question about that. Sorry. <clears throat> um. Sirius, the star, um, shows up in these different cultures around the world that were probably given their their knowledge from Atlantis. Um, and I think we've talked before on the phone about the fact that we are from that star. <clears throat> um, can you just kind of give a little bit of a like an overview of that before we move on? Sure. And then I'm done, I promise. <laughs> That's no problem. Um, so for everyone on the phone who may not have heard that, she spoke, or not be familiar with that, she spoke about the, the star Sirius, how the Dogon people in Africa um, say that that's where they originally are from, and they are sort of aware of the fact that that star is a binary star system, um, and were aware of that before sort of modern astronomy was able to observe that. Um, and there's uh, many other such instances in ancient peoples where they were aware of cosmic events and things that were not uh, recognized by modern astronomy until much, much later uh, based on their own oral tradition and spiritual tradition. Yep, 
binary star system. A binary star system is a star, well, there's two stars, and they rotate around each other. And I think most um, star systems in the galaxy, um, if I remember correctly, are binary star systems. So there, most of the time, there are two stars orbiting around each other. So Earth orbits around the sun. Um, but in most systems, there's some star orbiting around another star. And each of those stars may also have planets. But uh, Sirius, the one that the Dogons are aware of, um, is a binary star system. And the second star is just too small to see with the naked eye. So it's very interesting that the Dogon uh, were able to uh, well, already had knowledge of the second one, even though it's not uh, visible without things like telescopes, etc. So the Dogons uh, say that they have history with that star and that they are from there. Um, and that is the case with many different peoples in that they will say that they have a connection to particular groups of stars. Um, and all across the ancient world, you saw people paying much more attention uh, to the ancient sky uh, as, for obvious reasons, as uh, you could probably imagine, if there's nothing to do at night, you stare up at the sky. <laughs> but the spiritual connection is very much a real thing. And I think part of what it is, is that you can, uh, sort of trace the spiritual movement or uh, trace the uh, uh, the reincarnational, <laughs> if that's a word, movement of people across different star systems. And I know this is getting uh, more out there for usual Saturday morning conversation, but um, the Dogon are probably remembering a previous location of their own incarnation as human beings uh, on some planet around the Sirius star system. And I believe that there are all kinds of people from all different places in terms of uh, where we have incarnated from in our sort of history as spiritual beings and the path that we traced to get here uh, may have been from other star systems as well. I think that's the case with a variety of different peoples around the planet and ancient peoples paying attention to the stars would have been more aware of that in their own spiritual systems. Now that's not to say that there are not uh, quote indigenous people to this particular planet. I think they are, there are. Um, they are definitely black people. Uh, but I think that we are a mix of many things. Nick. Yes, sir. Um, in, in reference to um, the Dogon, um, we know that we are, we are, we are what? Our composition is the same as the, um, the universe on that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Atomic. So, suppose that what the Dogon, how they know that, is that they recognize or they knew that they were the universe and the universe with them, which means that they mirrored um, what um, was here. They mirrored the universe itself and they became aware of that star. Uh, serious too, and and uh, they they could see it because of the unicity they had with the universe. It's almost like looking in the mirror and seeing yourself, knowing that you that's you and you are it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And that is, uh, know ye not that you are gods? Yes. And that mirrors directly a. Uh, more ancient Egyptian version of that exact same thing. The temple of the gods is within you. And so yes. it is said, man 
O human, know, know thyself. If you know yourself, you will know the universe because you are a uh, harmonically, energetically, spiritually linked to everything that is. And if you know yourself, you can have knowledge of all uh, these physical things that we don't even uh, know yet in terms of sort of material science. That's how you can know about stars that are in the sky before anyone sort of sees them through a telescope. That's how you can know how to create uh, various forms of technology that we basically could not even imagine currently because of the way we approach uh, material science is different than the way you approach it with uh, sort of a deep spiritual knowledge of what this material uh, substance is. But absolutely. And that takes us back to alchemy. Uh, understanding uh, how we are uh, connected to uh, everything that is. Suppose that if we are, if we are one with the universe, or if we are one with God, then, and, and um, the Creator has always existed, then that means that we have always existed as well, which means that um, there is no such thing as a, quote-unquote, for lack of a better term, I should say, new human uh, being birthed into this earth, a new body, but not a, a new mindset. Um, because, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun, and if if all of us came from the same place and we did in terms of spirituality, then that same spirituality has always existed. So James Richard has always existed in spirit form and was um, brought into this earth through the parents that came together for an inexpressed purpose with an understanding that James Richard did not have to follow or complete that purpose if he chose not to. However, so the, the seed and, and the, um, the room that the seed was placed in were not haphazardly chosen. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Because it was being pulled from a place, it was being, with, um, I'm sorry, I'm not pulled. It was uh, being um, interjected into this realm for an express purpose, and the one who did it caused it to be what it is. It's the one who created everything that is, and here we are uh, um, different in terms of um, generational searching uh, for self, and as a result of that, has the opportunity and taking advantage of the opportunity to make sure uh, that um, this earth or mankind as we know it does not uh, go into another age of um, near distinction, as in the, um, the uh, as, and I say near distinction, as in the Neanderthal and other that came, others that were before us. So at this point in our existence, uh, we are granted uh, the opportunity to do something that the world has never seen before. Does that make sense? Can you see that? Mm-hmm. So, I'm done. Questions? Uh, good morning, Nick. Good morning, buddy. Yeah, uh yeah, no, I don't have a question, Nick, but I do, you know, want to just say in terms of your talking about, you know, the major events in terms of human evolution and uh, spirituality and religion, um, 
you had mentioned several weeks ago in reference to the green comet. And what was interesting is to look at that this will, you know, take place sometime in February. But I'm just trying to tie it into the fact that when you had mentioned to us to maybe look at some movies that was on Netflix, I just wanted to get your thoughts about the movie The um, Avatar in terms of uh, the way of the waters. And the reason why I speak about that, because in terms of us just talking about, um, you know, the impact of being aware of what's going on and just looking at you talking about the human evolution, um, the last time we had the green uh, comet was basically doing around the 50,000 year period, you know, uh, before the common era. And so as we look at that time, that's exactly around the time of the first uh, human family, which was the Twa and Buti people. And through that period of time, in terms of evolution, we can just see how, you know, again, spirituality has, you know, given us an opportunity to separate, you know, ourselves from the religion, but being able to appreciate you know, as I looked at it in terms of the way of the waters. And so I was just curious in terms of your explanation, how does what even Denise talked about, you know, in terms of the um, apocalypse, you know, the ancient apocalypse, but how it might relate to, you know, um, the Navatar, the Avatar, I'm sorry, in terms of um, how waters may impact on your thoughts about um, the movie. I don't know if that resonates, but... I'm just trying to get your perspective, you know, in terms of, again, the eternal waters and how it relates to looking more deeply esoterically. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, uh, Highly recommended if you have not seen or got a chance to see Avatar, if you can find a way to do it, if you can do (laughs) If the 3D effects do not make you queasy, I highly recommend you see it that way. Um, it was on a movie level, extremely entertaining and interesting. Um, but you are right. It is very much a uh, symbol of something much deeper that is happening in the terms of the transition humanity is making to a more spiritual awareness. Now, the 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 ease of that transition is not guaranteed, of course. We've talked about that many times um but we are making that transition and avatar the way of water uh black panther wakanda forever uh which actually i didn't see yet but uh, both of these movies are psychic heralds of the age of aquarius and james cameron is a director of the age of aquarius a movie director of the age of aquarius um and what that is is the the availability of an entirely new uh, energetic and spiritual atmosphere or spiritual water that we are submerged within uh, at all times. Um, but it is something that humanity overall uh, as a collective will become more and more aware of and connected to as we move further into this time period. And these two movies, well, in particular Avatar, is a uh, a psychic trigger to cause you to remember something, even if you've forgotten it. It will resonate with whoever sees it in a variety of ways, but mostly in the way to cause a certain remembrance to rise up within them. And that is to remember the original way humans related to each other and to this planet and the spiritual source of all of our uh, relationships to each other and to this planet and there's tons of symbolism in both avatar movies and i remember us speaking about the first one when it came out uh not 10 years ago but 13 years ago um and that number is significant uh there's a ton of stuff that I could talk about uh, about that movie. And let me just, 
I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll just go off. Uh, but let me just ask if there's any comments or questions. Has anyone seen it? Um, what are your thoughts about that or questions about that? If there's any other ones. Hey, this is Rainy Nick. Um, mm -hmm. I saw it um, in, in, Black Pan in Black Panther 2. Um, you know, I really liked the movie, The Kids, because uh, I took them to see it. Really liked the idea of the animals that were sisters or brothers, you know, to the whales that were that had sister or brother human um, counterpart. And, and they, they kind of reflected that later when we're talking about animals and, and their awareness. Um, I think the only detraction I have is kind of the trope. Um, that we see in science fiction written by white men, which is kind of the white savior. Um, it's very much still a part of that, even though that white savior lives in a blue body, right, in the movie. Um, yeah. But th that that was probably the only part where I went, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the Mars movie, right? The guy who goes to Mars. I forgot the, not movie, but there's a story, an uh, old one, um, Burroughs wrote, and it's kind of been recreated in a lot of sci-fi where where that um that tends to happen but um i i thought the idea of connection that you saw in the movie was was i mean it was even more than the one you know the first movie where they connected via that you know that physical tale or whatever they had with the animals is this one they were actually felt like talking to the animals um, and communicating them to them, and, and they were full partners in their and in, 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 and inhabitants in their world, not just um, you know, not just not separate like they are for us, you know. Yeah. Um. Hey Nick, may I interject some at this moment, please? Mm -hmm. Um. Let me. I want to make this comment. You, you're hearing a lot about the movies and, and, and about um, ancient history in regards to Atlantis and how it relates to us. Don't discount it. I say don't discount it. It's, it's because um, the story that's being told with these movies are stories that um, the church did not tell. And if the story is not told by the church, the creator is going to find somebody to tell the story. And when the story is told, the creator already has someone someone, or people in place to uh, translate it for what it really is. So um, in listening at what's going, what we're talking about now, it is very pertinent uh, to our uh, understandings of spirituality and our origins. I just want to interject that so you won't think that we are doing movie reviews. Thank you. Yes. And, and Pastor, I, I I think that was the, the same message when we were looking at uh, the, the African movies about the woman king and whatnot. It, these were spiritual messages that uh, you were not getting from the church or we were not getting from the church. So it, it, it gave all uh, not only the world, but specifically us as Africans, a, a chance to look at ourselves in a different light and even look at ourselves and, and recognize, because a lot of African Americans don't recognize any history other than the slave ship. So, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, these conversations are necessary. Yes, thank you. They're very much not just talking about the movie as a movie but rather as a uh, product of a collective spiritual state. Um, it is a sign of the times in the same way that that comet that is supposed to be in the sky somewhere around the beginning of February is. Um, these are reminders that we, that uh, bubble up to the surface of our awareness from time to time in order to catalyze a particular uh, transition. transition. Um, in order to represent and be symbols of the transition that humanity is going through in terms of our spiritual evolution. Um, Avatar and Black Panther very much are symbolic of what is happening to us on a subtle spiritual level 
and it will become more and more apparent as we move further into the uh, age of Aquarius. Um, oh, I think, can you mute your phone? Uh, somebody, not sure where that's coming from. Anyway, thank you. Uh, but an immense amount of symbolism uh, in both of these movies, but whenever you are involved in the creative process, you are tapping into a, a reservoir, a spiritual reservoir of archetypes. Uh, and there is a reason that um, if you've uh, ever heard of the hero's journey, which is a storytelling trope, <laughs> it is a storytelling pattern that resonates deeply with our own inner remembering of how spiritual evolution occurs. And so pretty much every story follows this pattern. Um, Avatar is very much a sort of history of uh, pre-European contact indigenous civilization. Uh, and that's there's more to it than that. Uh, everything was not all uh, perfect, of course, but uh, it is very much a story of how, <laughs> how white people must save themselves in order so that they do not destroy everything. Um, it does have that flavor of sort of white savior, uh, but that is a more surface level reading of it. Uh, the more deeper, deeper symbolic meaning that I believe is present in that movie is that it is a uh, physician heal thyself type of situation where the mentality represented by Europeans that was spread across the world is something that we have to examine uh, collectively and reject essentially and uh, specifically just the uh, sort of violent materially oriented aspect of it and that thing is happening when you see black people or when you see white people and white students uh shouting black lives matter etc <laughs> that is uh that character jake sully in the movie avatar gaining a blue body <laughs> Uh, that is a symbolic transformation of a rejection of a particular mindset. And that mindset is one of white supremacy. Uh, there are, um, well, with specific connection to the age of Aquarius, um, the reason uh, the Avatar movie is about water is because the water represents uh, in the age of Aquarius, a uh, sort of untapping of a reservoir of energy and awareness and knowledge that you can, or, well, that we are becoming immersed within and that we have to adapt to. Um, and part of what that energy reservoir does is cause us to uh, remember. It causes us to rebel against those things that are preventing us from being able to create a harmonious and more spiritually aware environment. Um, and that is uh, why James Cameron, I think, has like five of these movies lined up, is because for some reason, somehow he is very much tapped into the sort of uh, this struggle that we are wanting to go through on a collective psychic level but don't necessarily know how to do don't know, that we don't necessarily know what the uh what the battle lines are so to speak but i think what he's going to do with the rest of these movies is attempt to explain that in his own way and uh don't get me wrong i don't think james cameron is personally into uh these things necessarily but it doesn't matter. He just has to be himself and do the things that he likes to do uh, because those things are instinctually connected to deeper spiritual concepts. <laughs> um, Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. You've been saying um, the Jake Sully character is, is the white savior and all that. But I think too, there is also... What's the name of the woman behind them? The the native woman? Neytiri. Neytiri. There's Neytiri behind them who she's trying to teach him various spiritual kinds of things. 
he's a slow lear learner, but she is there and she's being very patient and she is teaching him. So um, is, and I, and the fact that she's a female, <clears throat> um, any elaboration on that? Yes, aspect? absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, it does have that flavor of white sort of saviorism, but I believe that is a more surface level reading of it. Um, guess what? We're all white. <laughs> and that's not exactly what I mean. It, we have all been tainted by a sort of egotistical, materially oriented uh, approach to understanding reality. Um, and that's not necessarily explicitly what is meant by white, but uh, the point is we are all uh, familiar with the beast and you can't defeat the beast unless you are familiar with the beast, unless you understand how it works. So Jake Sully, the character, is represented representative of exactly that. Um, he is an idiot, but he knows his enemy. Uh, Neytiri and all the native people don't fully understand the enemy and what it can do. And you have to know your enemy and know what it can do in order to actually defeat it. So <laughs> when I say we're all white, it's uh, what I mean is a majority of people living uh, sort of post European contact and pre European contact. But uh, the point is the mentality that that represents, the sort of uh, impact that the egotistical and materially oriented uh, desire that arose in humanity has impacted all of us. And we have to learn how to. We have to relearn what came before that. So in the sense that uh, in the movie, Jake is very much a representative of uh, sort of uh, the, the empire of, of European uh, white supremacy. He is also representative of all of us who have been in some way affected by that spiritually, mentally, physically, etc. cetera. Um, and our path to remembering what it takes to divest ourselves of that. Uh, and it is, of course, always uh, the feminine principle that remembers uh, what must be done in order to relearn the original ways of being. In this case, um, the uh, originally spiritually uh, based way of interfacing with each other and reality and the planet, et cetera. Uh, as we all know, um, well, <laughs> uh, when we talk in terms of uh, uh, the lineage of physical human beings and our sort of DNA history, uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, passed down through uh, women is much older and much more stronger of a connection uh, than sort of our history that is passed down through men. Uh, the feminine principle has a much stronger connection to its sort of spiritual source. And therefore, it's always the uh, that feminine principle that must play the part of teacher to the masculine principle, which is more likely to forget just based on how uh, men work, both symbolically, spiritually, and uh, materially, physically. That's why um, so many indigenous people, so many uh, ancient people uh, were matriarchal, not patriarchal. Um, and it's uh, in some ways uh, when the Europeans saw or learned of the way in which ancient peoples and indigenous peoples uh, ran their society, they were confused and they assumed it was patriarchal in some cases because they did not understand the, the symbolism or the uh, the structure of, of how things worked. Um, and they sort of projected their own sense of how things worked onto everything else. But uh, the reason uh, ancient peoples, indigenous peoples, and uh, I don't want to exclude uh, actually some white people as well uh, in, in various parts of the world, 
uh, were matriarchal and were more connected to their uh, sort of spiritual origin uh, is because of a, an instinctual remembrance of the uh, strength of spiritual awareness present within women as opposed to men. Um, and not that men don't have it, of course, but it is more naturally expressed and remembered and more easily interfaced with, uh, on average, in women uh, than it is with men. It takes more work for men to uh, sort of remember it and uh, uh, be able to fulfill their spiritual responsibility. It's easier for women to do that uh, in general. And uh, it's no coincidence that when you look at the as I mentioned, the DNA history, uh, it is stronger uh, along the line of women. Um, and that's just uh, it's something that, for example, modern science would have found out that any spiritually oriented and aware group of people would have known already. And that's exactly why they were uh, matriarchal, because they understood that the history is kept by the women uh, more accurately and more strongly. Comments. Nick, I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you spoke about us getting past the color because everybody in our in black skin is not us. And we need to, it's imperative that we get past this color barrier. Um because that will make us lose sight of who we are and our goal or our purpose of being here. And Pastor said a long time ago, it's about concepts. And concepts come in different shapes, different colors. And that has helped me get to where I am in many cases, because I grew up in the 60s. I was born in the 60s. So it's imperative that we get past the color barrier, because our goal is to get back to the beginning. And another thing I wanted to mention, this one guy was going back talking about Avatar. This one black guy asked, I think he said his name is James Cameron. Did I hear you right? The guy that made Avatar? Yeah, he's the director. This black guy said, why you don't make uh, movies about black people? And he said, I did. That's the purpose of Avatar. That's why I um, made the movie Avatar. It is about black people, melanin people, you know, melanin people. But that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I saw that video. Um, it's somebody was just filming their phone, I think, and like what they yelled at him something like, why, do you, why didn't you make him uh, black? Or why did you make a movie about black people? And James Cameron said, uh, no, they're blue in mine. <laughs> um, but I think there's other reasons for that. I, I think if you made them just from his perspective as a director, if you made them black, that would be just uh, too obvious and too it, it would cause a lot of backlash um it, but the sort of deeper reason for that is unfortunately if you see black people on the screen you feel differently um if you are uh, if your mind has been sort of influenced by a white supremacist uh worldview and once again, uh, the Jake Scully in the movie is the white savior, but who needs the most saving? It is white people. Uh, and so it is the process of how he learns how to save himself by learning from people who are not him. Um, hey, Nick, it's Ron. Mm -hmm. uh, question for you. If you look at, uh, we, we, we've talked about the universe, we talked about us being one, and and you, you said getting to know yourself and the internal you and knowing the universe. The binary star system is, uh, I want you to speak more on, is, is, is one dominant over the other? Is one considered masculine and one feminine? Uh, do, do they, the, 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 the rotations or, or the rotating around each other uh, influence something in the universe what 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 are we seeing there uh and, and how does that relate to us uh is that the masculine and feminine energy that's in 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 the human correct okay. <laughs> and I believe that okay. is the that's the important takeaway there um and 
in all things, you find the masculine and feminine principle played out in various ways. Um, even in uh, the way physical uh, sort of structures arrange themselves, it's a, it's an energetic principle that recreates itself and is found in all physical uh, principles. Um, of course, there are exceptions, like our star system supposedly is a single star system. Um, but there's many ways in which this can play out. Uh, not all people are married, for example. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> But the point is the recreation of that pattern is based on the energetic pre principles and spiritual principles that produce physical reality itself. So that principle is what influences the earth. It's not that the earth has no influence on it's, the universe and, or, it's, or is it? It's, a balance always, of ego. it's always back and forth. 100% um, uh, the sun has a greater influence on the earth and the earth has an influence on the sun. <laughs> but the earth very much does have an influence over everything because all things are connected. Um, it's uh, always a back and forth. It is a uh, dance between the of the principles. It is the relationship between masculine and feminine when we talk about the the war of the sexes or the battle of the sexes uh, what that is is a sort of cultural recognition of the need to resolve the fundamental conflict that exists between masculine and feminine and it is in the resolution of that conflict and the means by it is the by which that conflict can be resolved that all spiritual evolution occurs that the, the spiritual work is done. Um, when we look at the uh, sort of scientific definition of, of energy, it is the capacity to do work. Uh, it is the positive and negative uh, ends of a battery. Without that distinction, there can be no work done. There can be no energy moving and uh, accomplishing things. So the masculine and feminine is very much that uh, sort of two polarities uh, between which there exists the potential for spiritual work to be done. And I hope that wasn't all over the place, but uh, the reason for all of this distinction and all of these patterns that keep recreating themselves is that all of uh, our physical reality is a, uh, 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 a, configuration of matter that represents an energetic relationship between these spiritual principles. Uh, masculine and feminine, uh, represented in the binary star system, may, uh, men and women, uh, etc. It's all the uh, same and similar thing recreated at all sort of levels, uh, for lack of a better term. And in the movie Avatar, um, the uh, sort of feminine uh, principle is represented by the water, uh, is represented by uh, indigenous people, is represented by the uh, original spiritual connection and the matriarchal structure of society. The masculine, of course, is uh, the, the, the equivalent of the European. It's the equivalent of the materially oriented, uh, sort of egotistically based uh, society that wants to essentially dominate and destroy. That is the out of control ego um, that the male has to work on. That, that is the work that the spiritual side of uh, femininity and masculinity has to do. The male has to do more work uh, on himself in order to not be destructive. And he has to listen to the feminine because as we said before, the feminine is uh, more instinctively connected to uh, the healing and balance that comes through remembering our original spiritual connection uh, to each other and to all things. And what we are seeing by a transition to the age of Aquarius is very much a transition back to a uh, matriarchal way of running society. Um, and uh, on a spiritual level and on a physical material level. 
and we're in, we're still in the very beginning of this well in the beginning of this transition but it's why you see more women being part of uh sort of political bodies around the world um etc there's a lot of things that are playing out in the physical that are happening on a spiritual level and i forget exactly where it is but in the new testament when jesus says or there's a, a story about a man uh collecting water a man with the water pot uh i forget exactly where it mentions that but uh, that is essentially another symbol of the age of aquarius it is the men doing the things that women traditionally did <laughs> but in the spiritual that's sense what, that they, that's where the christ energy that's where the christ energy uh told uh the, the man to follow that man with the pot so that they could find a place for the upper room meaning of awareness um uh, yes anyway thank you um it is the the man doing what women traditionally do in the spiritual sense is reconnecting to that uh your your feminine side uh and what that means is uh relaxing and uh learning to purify your own ego so that you can remember that original spiritual and uh, connected awareness that is present within and allow that to guide your uh, actions that is what men have to do in order to save themselves and then save the rest of the world <laughs> sort of from themselves uh, in order to not be destructive um, it is also a source of uh the gender ident identity uh, uh, varieties that we see all the time now. Um, that kind of thing is was guaranteed to become more of a, uh, a sort of thing we're all aware of collectively because of this transition into a more uh, energetic and spiritually based state. Uh, now, some of that is the result of confusion um, and it is to whatever extent it is, it will work itself out as we move through this period of transition. Uh, but all of this fluidity that we are seeing is directly a result of us trying to figure out uh, how to adapt to this new energetic environment that we are in the beginning of. So that's where... Uh, you get that connection with the man carrying the water pot. That's where uh, the constellation or the symbol of the age of Aquarius is like a man pouring out water or something like that. But it's the um, gender flip-flop, <laughs> which spiritually, what that means is simply you coming, uh, you um, becoming more aware of the, if you're a male, your spiritually feminine qualities. And in this case, feminine and masculine are kind of, uh, not necessarily the best way to describe it because this is this is more about sort of deeper principles um and not physical males and women uh although physical males and women are more connected to these uh principles in various ways but the point is we are more similar than we are different and when we intertwine and learn to bring together these aspects of ourselves um then it allows us to become more aware of who and what we truly are and uh, take advantage of this uh, spiritual and energetic environment that we find ourselves within. To resist this transition, to resist the energy, basically produces uh, a form of confusion and self-destruction that we are all here trying to help humanity avoid. So all of our understanding, or let me say the original spiritual and inner understanding of who and what the creator is, naturally speaking, in a more balanced, uh, harmonious way of living on the earth and relating to each other, our understanding of the creator will become more feminine. <laughs> we will, like the many ancient peoples, uh, refer to the mother or refer to the earth mother um etc it's 
an awareness of the sort of nurturing connected nature of all things and how the fundamental if you had to pick a side masculine and feminine or feminine the fundamental nature of reality you would have to pick feminine there's no other thing the unity and harmony and uh, sort of connectedness of all things is more fundamentally feminine um, and again that's the spiritual principle so uh, women physical uh, uh, women are more instinctually connected to the feminine spiritual principle um, and it is that principle that we are learning how to interface with collectively on this planet uh, and that we must learn how to interface with in order to not destroy ourselves. Hey, Nick. Yes, sir. We've, we've uh, not quite an hour and a half, but uh, what do you think you want to pick up here tomorrow? That's a good stopping point for you. Well, I want to see uh, any comments or questions. I know we've I've done a lot. <laughs> yeah, you've covered a lot of ground. Not really. Okay. Um, um, oh, go ahead. There, totally. I think. I I think though we've covered a lot of ground, and I agree that this is a good stopping place because a lot of understanding has been um, offered today, and I um. I want us to listen very carefully and think about, ponder what's being said, especially when it relates to um, the um, the movement of the feminine energy in the earth, as represented, as Nick said, by the number of females you are beginning to see are in uh, governmental uh, positions. Um, and think about what that means. What, what does that represent? in terms of um, balance and birthing a new society. Um, again, I, I, I reiterate that um, it is impossible to understand the spiritual nature of our existence and our journey if um, we don't look at um, what's in the book in relationship to the... Um, uh, the historical aspects of spirituality, as well as um, the the um, spiritual inspiration that the writers of these movies are receiving for the benefit of those who are reading the signs of the times to be able to uh, translate slash interpret for the benefit of humanity. And again, thank you, Nick, and thank all of you for your participation. Um, I just wanted to say that before we end. Okay, Ron. Any uh, any last thoughts or questions, guys? Before we... Well, Nick, I, I will, I'm I also uh, sort of fascinated by what you said about the DNA in women, the, the, the strength of it and, and being older. If, uh, if you can, go over that again tomorrow and make sure I understand that. Or if you can go in more detail, that would be appreciated. Uh, other than that, uh, if, if there are no other thoughts or questions, uh, maybe we'll resume. Can we resume tomorrow, 11 a.m.? Sure. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me end on one additional thing, um, and we can pick it up tomorrow if you like. But uh, that is why um, sort of traditional religious settings will always be uh, restrictive to women. That is why they will always reject women. Um, that is changing, but uh, the influence of femininity has the uh, it, its guaranteed ability to uh, destroy uh, ego, or at very least point out ego that is destructive. And that can't happen within the uh, sort of power structure of most uh, institutional religious settings because they are all ego-based. And you cannot have a uh, reminder of spiritual truth within that kind of setting. 
And that is why women are, for the most part, uh, kept out or controlled within those settings. So I just wanted to mention that uh, we can end for today if everyone likes. Okay. Thanks, everyone, and I uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks, Nick.